Welcome back to Sacred Arts Academy, where we talk about all things from the spiritual to the sacred. I am so excited to have Jade on today. We are going to be um, talking a little bit about spiritual awakening and tarot and uh, CVD. Uh, Jade originally is from Oxnard, California, spent a significant part of her career in San Diego, where she built a corporate path in digital marketing and e-commerce. After a decade of struggling with imposter syndrome, overwhelm, and self-doubt, she found herself facing burnout. This experience became a turning point, prompting her to leave her social her, her socially acceptable corporate career and pursue her true calling. From this transformation emerged Jade Collaborative, a female founded CBD and hemp empowerment brand. The company is dedicated to helping high achievers and survivors of hustle culture protect their peace and maintain their power, enabling them to break free from burnout and design their dream lives. Jade's lifelong fascination with human behavior and the social structures that shape identity, beliefs, and actions led her to pursue a master's degree in sociology with a specialization in social psychology. She also holds a master's degree in business administration, which has enhanced her ability to navigate the practical business world. Through her personal journey and academic background, Jade has positioned herself to guide others in finding balance and fulfillment, leveraging her unique blend of sociological insight and business acumen. Welcome, Jade. Thank you so much. Wow. I didn't realize how lengthy that bio was. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I love your bio because I it speaks to so many of our stories as well. And you're living a lot of our dreams in terms of consolidating this choice of participating in society by going to school and climbing that corporate ladder and yet feeling like there's something missing and and yeah. you were able to break free from that. Can you tell us a little bit about that background and what drew you initially to the corporate business world and then how you made that transition? Yeah, I, I feel like collectively we're experiencing this specifically among women, men as well, but it seems as though us uh, former cor corporate girlies are out here healing and, um, for me, I kind of just found my way. I stumbled into business, ironically. Um, my fascination with human behavior, like I said, led me to pursue my education in sociology. And when I graduated from my master's program, it was at a time where economically there weren't a ton of uh, career opportunities. So it was a great time to stay in school. And I think that high achiever hustle culture kind of, you know, uh, deeply ingrained, you know, need to achieve kind of um, drive, sent me back to school to earn more and almost validate myself because I didn't feel my sociology background was enough. So I went to business school and kind of found myself shortly after graduation in full fledged in my, you know, corporate career. And I just was kind of riding this wave that wasn't that I realized at some point wasn't actually the wave that I wanted to be riding. It was the one that was sort of provided for me. And um, so here I am going from corporate to cannabis and tarot cards. I love it. Um, how did you make that transition from the business world to being a full-time tarot reader, spiritual guide, and, you know, offering this amazing plant medicine um, for those of us that are continuing to <laughs> experience the corporate world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an ongoing there. I wouldn't say there was one big, huge moment. I would say it was a series of small moments and small decisions that kind of led me where I look back on the path and I'm like, wow, I can kind of connect the dots and see how one thing led to the next. If I had to choose kind of this pivotal moment I did in, you know, I think the ripple effect of COVID impacted us a lot and how we kind of viewed the world as well as how we viewed ourselves. And I found myself in maybe like 2021 or so really deep in this self-discovery and healing journey for myself. And I started to realize that 
the script I was living by wasn't one that I wrote. And so um, I think in that, in that moment, I, I was able to do some self-reflection and really get clear on what it is that I valued and what I enjoyed and what are the things that I kind of learned that I valued and I enjoyed. Mm. Yeah. I love that because it really is about coming back to yourself and kind of figuring out like, okay, what are the stories that have been told to me that I'm now living out versus now I have had this awakening and now I know that, yes, I chose this life, but it's not necessarily the one I chose. Right. Um, you know, the, the one that I want to be on. And so I think it takes courage to admit to that and mm -hmm. courage to actually do something different. And I see a lot of people doing that and then going down the path of having their dream and doing what they want to do. And somewhere along the way, they kind of get discouraged because maybe they're not making as much money in the corporate world or maybe it's not what they thought it was. Like, what would you say um, m keeps you motivated in mm -hmm. the path that you have chosen now? Having the contrast. The more that we know what, about what we don't want, we tend to kind of filter down and get clear on what we do want. And for me, you know, I did live on paper. I had everything figured out. I had everything that I wished for, I dreamed for. And I still felt hollow at my core. And so I really, that's sort of what led me to go deep into the introspection to really understand, you know, I had a lot to be grateful for. And I knew that I lived a life that was one that, you know, my problems were problems others prayed for, you know? And so I, I really had to go, well, what is it about? I, I kind of, achieved the things that I set out to achieve. I accelerated in my career faster than I thought I would. I was making more money than I ever thought I would ever be able or felt worthy of, of earning. And I still, again, felt so, you know, there would be days where I almost wish that I would get into some type of catastrophic accident on the way so I wouldn't have to deal with the things that the day held for me, which is, it sounds very dramatic and extreme, but those kinds of thoughts were popping into my mind and it was concerning me. Like, where am I? Because practically, and you know, when it comes down to it, I would never want anything like that to happen. But why were these thoughts and feelings kind of appearing? And so um, that's when I actually learned burnout's a real thing. And it's not just a colloquial term or something, you know, just some jargon that we throw around. It's an actual thing with symptoms and phases. And it was something I was experiencing over and over again. And so that's when I got clear that I didn't want that life anymore. And I think where the courage came in was really realizing when I could see the world, not from the blinders of, you know, me looking into my laptop for 12 hours a day, or me even looking at, you know, um, an aerial view of the office building that I worked in, or even zooming out, I kept kind of expanding my vision to the point where I could almost see my problems and my life from the perspective of, you know, we're in the cosmos, and we could see planet Earth. And I'm like, there's all these little problems happening <laughs> on that planet. And none of them matter. <laughs> and so that moment when I realized this world that I was so embedded in was actually you know, literally finding myself in the matrix, I like zoom out and I'm like, okay, my little problems in my office world are really nothing. And I can, I can be outside of this. And then I really start to feel a lot more expanded and then taking that type of expanded action to leave the corporate world and step into my own, the cannabis and tarot card world. Oh, that's so powerful. I really do think that when we zoom out, and look at the bigger picture and look at things from a different perspective, whether it's through the matrix or, you know, through astrology or through another person's eyes. Um, I think that it allows us to kind of observe ourselves mm -hmm. and really kind of gain a, a wider perspective of where we're at and what truly matters. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned burnout. And I want to go back to that a little bit because I think that that is something that is so prevalent in our world and society today. And you are somebody that sounds like you were able to observe yourself and really question these things that were coming up. Mm 
What would you recommend for somebody that's kind of starting this journey and is really entrenched in that burnout sensation? Mm. I think it's, it starts with first start noticing and it's going to sound very, you know, in alignment with any type of mindfulness advice we might get, but here's literally what, what, why I believe so much in these things. I think I used to kind of roll my eyes at the journaling, the meditation, the mindfulness work, you know, and it sounds so very like woo woo and whatever, but it's like, because I've actually experienced the life, the transformational life changing experience of doing those things of integrating that into my life i i wholeheartedly can tell the next person that hey this can help you so for me i started to get clear on how i was feeling because i think a lot of us operate on autopilot and we don't even realize that we're feeling what we're feeling so one of those things in burnout is that you're spiraling and you don't even know you're spiraling this is just normal mode of default operation and when I started to get clear on what I was feeling in my body in on uh, what, you know, is there an email from somebody that makes evokes a certain feeling or a certain sense of anxiety that rises up in my chest? What does that feel like? Where is that coming from? I started to get really clear and attuned to my own self. And what that allowed me to do, because I can't observe myself, when I would get into difficult or challenging situations at work, conversations, you know, tough conversations at work, rather than getting enveloped in the kind of chaos of the storm, I was able to almost float above the room and watch myself have the conversation with the person I was conversing with. And, and almost rather than allowing kind of that emotional overdrive to take over, you know, when our nervous system gets into that kind of flight, fight, flight, or freeze, even when we're at work, we kind of will tense up and, and show up in a way that we don't really want to, I would start to just kind of watch myself and play it like a video game. And just mm. kind of observe from a third person's perspective and own that I'm in control. I'm a master of my mind. I'm a master of my body. I'm a master of my emotions that I could then better kind of rein it in and and navigate that in a way that I could, you know, stand by that I'm proud of that was actually me being in my power. And so um, that was really helpful for me in just kind of getting out of that, that cycle and to find my my ground again, if you will. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, I almost imagine it as um, operating from your higher self and, mm. and allowing the higher self to uh, dictate or control that situation or, or seeing it from that perspective versus allowing our ego or emotions to cloud that perspective, um, yes. which is really beautiful. Yes. Thank you. I'm curious about, you know, some of the pivotal experiences that you've had with plant medicine and uh, while walking this journey of your spiritual awakening. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yes. Um, so I started using plant medicine in 2019. Um, it's not something I particular and by plant medicine, cannabis, CBD, daytime, it's something that it's not going to create any type of psychoactive high. And then THC at night would sort of be my way of decompressing. And I started incorporating therapy and meditation in 2020, 2021. And it was in meditation on my balcony at night. I, you know, had THC that night. And I, in that moment, had what I can describe now as a spiritual awakening. I had that feeling of the best way I can even, it's really tough to attach words that capture the experience, but the best I can describe it is feeling this total sense of oneness and peace and everything is okay and right and where it's supposed to be and feeling this mm. overall connectedness to source, to the universe, to everything, to all the parts, us, um, all the beings, all the plant, everything. And just feeling like that, it, just feeling a part of that power, you know, you're, it's like you're everything and nothing all at one time. 
Um, the nothing is just how tiny our, our problems are, even though in from our perspective, our view in our typical kind of autopilot mode, it feels like it's everything and it's all encompassing and it's just that's our world. But when we can zoom out and literally see it from the universe, that makes sense. Um, that's what I was, it was almost like I was floating and I could, I could kind of see everything and felt at total peace, no matter what outcomes happened, what, no matter I could have died in that moment and been totally at peace. Mm, that's so beautiful. I love it when we're so aligned that mm -hmm. we're able to have that kind of clarity. And can you tell us a little bit about how Jade Collaborative came about and what your vision for that was? Yeah, so Jade Collaborative was and is kind of that first foundational piece. I knew it was, you know, all of the experience I accumulated, kind of going back to your initial question about how I was able to kind of make the leap. I think I did, you know, things to be grateful for in terms of the rough edges that polished me in the business experience, right? The, the burnout and the things. And, you know, I also acquired a lot of practical skills. And so it was time for me to then kind of paint that onto the canvas of what is my own. Okay, now I'm picking up the pen and I'm writing my story. Now I'm dipping my own brushes in my paint and I'm, you know, creating the picture of my life. And Jade Collaborative was one kind of step or that first step. And I knew um, that it would grow into whatever it was meant to grow in. But I just, in terms of having a product that I can offer the world and bring the world to the world, it was something that had helped me in my own personal journey. And so I wanted to get, I knew that going into business and in my corporate experience, it would have to be something I really cared about. You can't pour all of your time, energy, and attention into something is what I learned in my past life. You can't pour all your time, energy, and attention into something that you can't get behind, that you don't have a passion for, or that you is not in alignment with your purpose. It's not sustainable and it's not fulfilling. And so I was, you know, I feel my true purpose is bringing healing and um, evolution back to the world. So things that heal me, medicine that I need pour that back out into the world. And I think a lot of us, especially in the wellness industry, we are in the business of something that helped us heal or that we need, right? <laughs> so um, for me, that was cannabis one. And then, you know, a year later, I'm finding myself reading tarot for people other than myself and my family and my friends. And it became something, you know, the next kind of a piece of the Jade Collaborative ecosystem. And as we know, we need to take a comprehensive approach to our wellness and our health, where, you know, it's not just what's happening on a medical level or a body level, but it's also the mind and the spirit. And so, you know, I feel that the cannabis piece is, is helping with the physical aspect, which also impacts our mind and our spirit, but also the, the um, tarot kind of, modality healing modality would come in and serve the spiritual side mm -hmm. and also the mental the mind side of it as well so um you know it's unfolding everything's continuing to unfold and so we'll see if we have this same conversation a year from now <laughs> that's what it sounds like but yeah that's kind of how i yeah <laughs> I am so proud to announce that we are launching another YouTube channel called Third Eye Wide Awake, a podcast about ghosts, cults, and deeper knowledge on spiritual stuff through storytelling. I love that. I, I think tarot also is a way of connecting, connecting yeah. with spirit, connecting to your guides. And um, so speaking of which, I, I want to take your um, your perspective on the archetypes of tarot and the symbology which ones resonate with you the deepest and which ones do you personally um identify with on the spiritual path yeah there's a few that come into my mind and the first one that sticks out the most is the empress card and she's somebody who is she's the mom of the tarot and as a cancer sun and a cancer moon, uh, cancers are the moms of the Zodiac. And so there's 
a lot of synergy and crossover there, even though the Empress card, its astrological association is with Capricorn, which happens to be my rising sign. And so I just feel so deeply connected to that card. Um, for that reason, it's, it, you know, it's a nurturing card. It's a creative card card it's it's a you know and being a mother doesn't necessarily mean giving birth to only human children but also giving birth to creative projects or creating something like a brand from the ground up or a product from the ground up or a tarot practice from the ground those are the things that um, really bring me joy and so I feel I really identify with her but on my journey to getting into her or stepping into that energy I really felt the ten of swords and the Ten of Swords, although it's a, a minor arcana card, it's kind of symbolic to me as um, I see it as, you know, one of the meanings being like an ego death. And not that our ego dies and it never comes back. <laughs> it's like the journey ain't linear, right? But that it was a certain, um, the death of a way of thinking, a mindset, the way that I looked at life, the way that I looked at what success meant. And that's really what truly sent me on, you know, the new ground, which the Ten of Swords leads into the Page of Swords, which is kind of like, you know, new student to new life, a new mindset, new ideas. And um, I wouldn't have gotten there and stepped into that Empress energy had I not had that kind of uh, shedding of skin, if you will, <laughs> from my past life. Wow. I mean... The Ten of Swords is the one where the guy is on the floor and there's all these these swords yeah. on his back. That is such a powerful card. And what a vulnerable thing to say. I, I love um, the rawness of that. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. And a little bit more about the Ten. I'm trying to find, find the Ten of Swords right now. Um, is, you know, it's a burden, right? It's the, it's, but Tens are, symbolic of kind of endings, um, mm -hmm. the completion of something. And so it's like, you're putting the burden down. And for me, it was like, you're putting your armor down, you're putting your ego down, all the protected, all the defense mechanism, that shield that you would carry around that cancer hard shell <laughs> that, you know, we would use to protect ourselves, maybe worked at one time. And so we can kind of give ourselves grace for earlier versions of who we were. But also, there comes a time where when you step into that new version of you, that evolution, that you have to put down or shed the skin or put down the armor or put down the swords. And so change the mindset. And so that's why the Ten of Swords just, I, when I read that question today, that card literally appeared in my mind. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what are you doing here? So <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's why you're there. All right. So, um, so yeah, that's a big one for me. Wow, I love that. Oh, yeah. I just got all chilled. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, she doesn't want to show up right now. I'm stuff shuffling through this deck. But um, but yeah, 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 yeah. The ten of swords. Oh, there it is. This one in this deck, it says everything yeah, is fine. That's the that's one. A ten of somebody weighed down by all their stuff. <laughs> yeah, symbolic of that death and rebirth, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. powerful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And from your perspective, what does the current collective consciousness and energy represent in the either the major or the mi minor arcana? Um, and what archetypes are we embodying as a collective? I really feel a lot of reverse hierophant energy. Ooh. And the hierophant is a very, uh, it's a card symbolic of tradition, systems, old, you know, institutions. And I see a lot of our institutions being turned on their head right now. And I see collectively there's a growing mistrust in our institutions and in the way things were. Um, I see that in our political system, um, on our uh, geopolitical scale, um, just sort of, you know, us as a nation being in the United States, kind of being the leader of the world. There's, you know there's a uh, diminishing trust in just us collectively globally that's beginning to shift the power dynamic in in the um, geopolitical world but also us here internally the way in which i think we used to entrust the federal government um unquestionably is starting to kind of you know with social media information age um, the power of spreading messages we're starting to unveil the humanness 
in these institutions. A lot of times I feel like we're so far removed or disconnected from like the government or the, you know, these big, powerful, omnipresent institutions. But when we really look at it and we lift the veil, it's filled with a bunch of humans just like us on this earth, trying to heal our inner child wounds, trying to figure it out. And so I think that's being put on full display right now. And we're really starting to take, uh, you know, certain matters into our own hands, whether that means, you know, uh, us not following that traditional script that I followed where, you know, you go to school, you get a job, you, uh, you know, clock in and out for 40 years at the same place and you buy a home and you have you know, all of these things, especially as a, a generation. And I think you're one of my fellow millennials. Am I right, Jesse? Yeah. I yeah. <laughs> millennials, especially, we're very much on the forefront of shifting the, you know, breaking old traditions. Um, we're the first generation that didn't get married shortly after high school and start having a family. We're the first generation where we replaced, you know, pets with plants and uh, kids with pets. And we're the first generation where we really serve as this bridge, this gap between the old world and the newer world, which is us kind of um, supporting our our boomer parents and, uh, you know, bosses in the corporate world with how to operate technology, how to log on to a Zoom call, how to, you know, the whole convert a Word doc to a PDF, all of that. <laughs> we're IT for our you know, former generation. And then we're also kind of the the adults in the room when it comes to, you know, Gen Zers are coming into their own as well. But right now we're the ones with our frontal lobes fully developed. We've lived some life. We can kind of, you know, we're sort of that middle, we're that bridge right now that's kind of holding it all together, I feel. And so, um, yeah, collectively, I think we're kind of going through this reverse hierophant where we're, re, where we're challenging tradition and from an astrological, I'm not an astrological uh, expert by any means, but there's a lot of association with that in tarot. And so what I do know is that Pluto moved into Aquarius from Capricorn and Aquarius is about rebellion. And, you know, we've been seeing this shift happen over since 2008, you know, Aquarius, what, or I'm sorry, Pluto was in Capricorn, which is more about rule following and tradition and <laughs> kind of ones and zeros and rows and columns and then you get into Aquarius which is more rebellious type of an energy and so if you can see what happened from 2008 to 2023 there was a lot of transformation there was a lot of shifts there were a lot of change you know the advent of the smartphone that took place in 2007 really revolutionized the way we collectively interacted with the world and each other and so um, I'm, I'm seeing that continual shift happen we're at the advent of AI we know this is going to change our society the way the internet going from offline to an online society happened. So there's all kinds of shifts from our belief in our institutions to our belief in our, you know, career, go to school, traditional career path to um, the shifts in the way that we utilize technology. Um, and that's just to kind of name, name a few off the top. <laughs> mm, no, yeah. well said. Thank you for that insight. And I do see that, uh, how that connects to what I'm seeing as well in the collective. And I really love how you position that and how it relates to that archetype. And I even loved how you completely like um, referenced the Pluto because it's so true. Like now that we are fully in Pluto and Aquarius, we are starting to kind of see a lot of that soften up and, you know, and there's like so much opportunity for, mm -hmm death and rebirth and innovation and all that good stuff. And so I'm curious to know, looking ahead, what archetypes or energies do you see on the horizon for humanity's collective and our spiritual evolution? You definitely named the death. I see, you know, and it's not all bad. I, I think, you know, a lot of times we hear terms or phrases like, oh, you know, the country's going to hell in a handbasket. Like you might hear that from <laughs> older folks or whatever the news and you know there is a lot of chaos and with those breakdowns come the breakthroughs and so i do see tower moments for our nation for our our uh, global community i see a lot of um breaking down of old foundations the way things once were i think we're seeing that in the relationship that uh nations have with israel and with you know a, a genocide being documented in gaza right now i feel like there's a lot of old standing beliefs around what's right, what's wrong, who, you know, whose life matters more than another person, or, you know, those things, those ideas are being questioned. 
And so I do see us having these catastrophic tower moments, whether that's, um, you know, falls of political power, falls of old ideas and belief systems. And I see those coming and crashing down and really this reckoning that we're having with ourselves as a collective. Um, and then that kind of rippling down into an individual experience. And then following that, the death card, right? So it's like old ideas, beliefs, similar to the, I see a lot of connection with that Ten of Swords energy as well, um, kind of laying those old ideas to rest. And I see a lot more kind of following after that, that hope, that kind of peace, serenity, a lot of feminine energy where we are being, you know, more, it's more accepted that we're leading from our heart and not just the mind or the ego. We know that mind, body, spirit, it's all connected. But I think what happens is what's thought as a thought of as feminine or like heart centered or heart led was maybe traditionally or historically devalued. And now we're seeing more female leadership step into play. I saw that happening in my in my corporate career where, you know, we were going from kind of this top down authoritarian leadership style that might resemble something of, you know, 90s corporate culture to, hey, let's actually, you know, it's not, it's not realistic to ask a human to check their emotions at the door. It's like you're asking them to cut off one of their arms, you know, and not to say that we don't still balance that with the logic, but it's almost like we're we're okay with being a little bit more vulnerable in work because vulnerability takes courage. And so that's thought of as a strength rather than a weakness that it once was. And I see that resonating, that type of um, female energy type of leadership being more uh, not just respected, but needed after mm. these tower, these reckonings that we're having um, mm. as a society. Well, that's something to look forward to because I feel like my entire career, it's all been very masculine um, in terms of like yeah. workplace, even at home, like the way things are ordered, the way that you see things, the, your perspective, the way that you grew up, it's all in the masculine, right? Being on time, like having a list, doing doing things in a certain order. And I think it's time to let the feminine side um, because you need the feminine to balance it all out. Um, balance. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. not like we don't need structure. We definitely need structure and we need flow. Right. So it's, you know, a water, you know, a container needs its water and a water needs its container. So for us to really kind of take form, um, we need, we need both. And so it's not to say again, that there's certain aspects of male style leadership that completely has to go. It's just a matter of balancing it with, Ugh. with more vulnerability and with some more, you know, and softness and not devaluing softness, actually seeing that vulnerability as a strength. Yeah. Well said. Um, for those feeling called to start their own spiritual journey, what advice would you give based on your experiences? Yeah. So I think one of the things that people tend to get discouraged by, and I know I was discouraged by it when um, people are told, oh, just meditate. People are like, what do you mean? <laughs> and you're like, I have ADHD. How am I supposed to sit here and empty my head? Right. And, you know, so for me, I, I was actually encouraged by a few different people on a few different occasions, like, hey, you should meditate. And I'm like, whatever, whatever, you know. Um, but it is. I see meditation as a necessity in your spiritual journey, point blank. That is you connecting with yourself. That's that, um, if I'm going to put it in tarot speak, it's the uh, high priestess connect, getting connected to the subconscious and something I actually didn't get to dive into yet that I'm really excited. Thank you for the segue is that, you know, us for us to uh, kind of access that higher self, we have to access our subconscious. And when we're operating on autopilot, I mean, every single day, we're thinking on average of 70,000 thoughts, which is so many thoughts. And so we're processing a lot of information. We're having a lot of these thoughts. Well, 90% of these thoughts are influenced by our subconscious mind. And these thoughts and these core beliefs are shaping the actions we take, what we believe is possible for ourselves, and then ultimately what our material reality looks like. Had I been operating or continued to operate by my subconscious beliefs that I wasn't worthy or that I couldn't or that I wasn't capable of starting my own brand, my own company, 
I would have still been in that cycle of burnout <laughs> that I was able to break out of. And really breaking out of that required me to access the subconscious so that I could start to get clear on what was happening because I didn't even know how my operating system was functioning because it was just happening. And when you can make the subconscious or the unconscious conscious, then you can start to make conscious choices in that awareness in that knowledge is that power. And then in that power is that that choice. And so when you can kind of make those choices, because you're aware now, then you can start kind of, you know, shaping your life the way you want. But in order to access that, getting into a state of meditation, um, which did play an integral role in that spiritual awakening alongside the cannabis, and now I'm learning the science behind it, by the way. And if it's okay, if I go into it a little bit. Yes, please. Um, so having that, as I was talking about that spiritual awakening and feeling this sense of oneness and then diving into my, you know, starting my own business and learning more about the science behind cannabis and then learning more even about the science behind spirituality, which historically has been kind of on these two opposite polarizing and you know you have science and you have you know empirical evidence and the scientific method and then you have spirituality woo woo things that the scientific community doesn't necessarily believe in and so now what we're seeing is you know collectively we're all kind of returning home to our roots and we're also seeing empirical science start to validate spiritual practices that human beings have been doing for thousands of years and um part of that in that meditation that i was able to kind of instill, I call it, uh, it was when I instilled my internal guidance system, like it was almost like my internal GPS was installed when I had that experience on my balcony. And you can't go back, even when you know, you're veering off course, that compass is there. And it's going to tell you rerouting reroute, like, girl, you better get back over here. <laughs> so you can't unsee it, you can't unfeel it, you can't ex unexperience it. And what I learned was happening is that I was actually in a state of consciousness where I'd actually access the portal to my subconscious. And the way that we do that is when we can actually relax and calm our nervous system. And there's our brainwave activity that's taking place. We have kind of these, you know, uh, primary, these kind of, there's a few different ways that we're states of being that we're in. And the brainwave activity is um, when we're in these states of being includes um, beta, which is kind of right now we're in beta, it's our everyday, it's our, we're problem solving, we're thinking, we're making decisions. Um, but it can also kind of lead to stress and anxiety being in beta, we can be stressed out at work, we can be, you know, we're very aware, but we're not necessarily uh, in a relaxed state. Then we're getting into alpha, which is when we're sort of chilling, and we're, you know, maybe laying down, getting ready to go to sleep. Similarly, you're sitting down, you're kind of getting calm, you might be doing some breath work and centering yourself. Now you're starting to get your brainwave activity going from beta into alpha. And now this is where things get fun because we're starting to lift the hood to the operating system. And then we can start to kind of see what's in there and start to, to shape and play and upgrade that. Dr. Joe Dispenza talks a lot about this. So if you guys want to go down that rabbit hole, um, he's kind of the thought leader or the spokesperson on a lot of this. Um, but once you go from the theta or from the alpha state, now your brainwave can relax into a state of theta. And that's, you know, when you're working with a hypnotherapist, they're helping you get into that relaxed state of theta to where you can start to, again, uh, you know, uh, sometimes things, old childhood traumas or memories that people have been suppressing for years start to come up in these states because now they're able to start a, you know, kind of, again, access that subconscious belief or that subconscious thought or suppressed emotion. And, um, and then that the last one, which I believe I was in this state, and in order to even get to this state, you have to go through alpha, you have to go through theta, is gamma. And gamma is where it's such a high vibe, for, everything's an energy, right? Everything's a vibration, everything's a frequency. Well, similarly, our brain waves in a state of gamma are going off. And it's when you're so awake, and you're so aware, and you're so it was that epiphany moment that I had, I've or third eye opening could be another way that we think of it that pineal gland in our brain, that is what literally opened for me in that moment. And so after having experienced it, I really wouldn't have even called it a spiritual awakening at a time, I didn't have the language to like really describe it, to now actually understanding the science behind it, and how cannabis helped me even relax into those states <laughs> um, was really exciting for me. So to bring it back, 
and land the plane if I'm if I'm uh, trying to provide someone with advice for how to start their spiritual journey, get into that meditative state. The per- the progress over perfection is the kind of mindset you want to go into it with. Don't shame yourself if you can't. Uh, if you start to find your mind wandering, actually celebrate it because the idea behind meditation it's almost like a mental workout or a spiritual workout. It's where you're you're tuning your focus. You're um, you're doing these reps, and so every time you find your focus going off center, think of it as a rep and bring it back to center and celebrate that you completed a rep rather than getting discouraged and going, ah, forget it. That's, I'm, I'm done with meditation. It doesn't work. <laughs> I promise you over time, start small and just, you know, release the need for the perfectionism about it. And, um, and, you know, hopefully you'll find over time, you can sit, get, get really curious about that, that almost choose your own adventure in your mind. You get really um, clear about where your mind goes and where your thoughts go and what kind of things are just happening in there. There's a whole universe in there. Like it's really exciting. I promise you. So just give it a chance, start small and just stay consistent with it. Just like you would any type of workout routine or other type of health routine. That's amazing advice. I, I will say that, um, I've studied with some shamans and from different lineages and the different states of brainwave is something that they really focus on, in particular the theta, because theta mm-hmm. really is where your miracles happen. It's where mm-hmm. healers tend to be when they're performing Reiki or they're performing energy work or whatever the case may be. And because we're constantly in beta, we hardly ever get the chance to go into theta unless we're going to sleep. And if you think about it, we're only in theta for just such a small period of time. So by practicing going into that state, the more and more you're able to regulate your nervous system and the more and more you're able to drop in and get into that meditative state. Um, It's it's so fascinating to me. Uh, Yes, I'm sure we could probably have a beer over this. Well, yeah. health. Let's go have a beer and talk about wellness. <laughs> <laughs> I am down. I can talk about it forever. <laughs> and so um, I have one last question for you before we close up. Um, I want to go back to um, Jay Collaborative and your point of view on plant medicine as teachers mm-hmm. and not just CBD, but also ayahuasca, psilocybin, um, in And how do you view these as a way to support people through their spiritual awakening and their growth? Yeah. So, you know, I think the, the plant medicines you listed off all have some kind of, or have had a stigma attached to them. Right. And I think again, going back to the collective and that reverse hierophant energy, we're returning home to our roots. Like we're starting to actually see um, the medicinal benefits of these things that, you know, the nature that we've criminalized, essentially. And I think kind of going back to the uh, mistrust that we now or the critical lens we're shining on our institutions, that includes the healthcare system, right? And so when we think about why these things have been um, criminalized, or there's a stigma attached to them, and then you ask yourself, well, who does that benefit? (laughs) is it beneficial for our healthcare industry, which is a for-profit multi-billion dollar industry? Who is it, who is it um, benefiting when we're talking about self-healing or healing from natural herbs or things that grow from the earth? And so um, as far as how it plays a role kind of in our spiritual journey, I mean, just kind of the way that it allows us to awaken those states of being in ourselves so that we can start to pick up our own pen and write our own story. Um, Where else was I going with that? I just, I feel like these are, these are tools that were given to us on this earth and this planet that were meant to be, to be used and not um, shamed about. And, you know, there are things that, humans people have been using for thousands of years to to help us heal and so um yeah so that's my that's my perspective on that and then also to say similar to how you know we're, we need to mix more of the feminine energy with the masculine energy it's about balance too modern medicine has has afforded us wonderful things and that's that's great and 
if there is something that we can truly find beneficial and healing for us from a, you know, traditional meta traditional in the sense of what we call traditional now traditional sense by all means do it and you know shine that critical lens on how our healthcare system tends to just be so trigger happy with dispensing a pill or a surgery or you know insert profitable thing here um how you know who is it who is it really serving you know who is it really benefiting and is this something that I, you know, is there another way that is true to our roots that could actually help me achieve the result that this is promising me? So it's just mm-hmm. about balancing the two. Yeah. Absolutely. I, it reminds me of this article that I read a, a while back about how every country in the world, except for America, has a way to, uh, has a practice to be able to purge what you don't need. And when I really think about it, like things like ayahuasca and peyote were the things, the plant medicine that our ancestors used to take in, you know, South America or wherever these things grow in order to be able to purge physically, mentally, spiritually, the things that no longer serve us. Mm -hmm. And even like as a kid, like my parents are from Central America. As a kid, I remember we call it purgante. I don't know what it's called in English. Um, it's like escaping my mind right now, but basically they would give me something every morning so that I I would regulate and I would be able to purge, you know, whatever is not mine. And it's, I just find it so interesting that Americans are, it's the only culture that does not have that practice. (laughs) Mm -hmm. We also have a pretty big medical industry too. Mm. (laughs) It's interesting, right? How the two connect. It's it's, what's that old saying? Follow the money. (laughs) Follow the money. Yes. Mm. Oh, so can you tell us a little bit about what you have going on? How can people find you? What are your events? Yeah. So I do pop-up markets frequently, mostly in the Ventura County area. Last last weekend, I was up in Buellton at a winery. It was beautiful. That was a fun place to do a market. But usually I'm in the Ventura County area a couple Saturdays a month. And I keep everybody posted on my Instagram page at Jade Collaborative, where I'm going to be. If I'm going to an event where I'm doing only tarot, generally speaking, if I can do tarot and have some C- a CBD display, I will do both. But most of the time... Um, it's a little tough for me to do tarot and then do CBD. So then I I will uh, do some tarot only events, which I will keep people posted on my tarot with Jade Instagram page. And that is where you can book readings with me. I'm actually at Malone's metaphysical shop right now down the street from you, Jesse. I think yeah. yeah, in Camarillo. Yeah. So I'm here in old town Camarillo. I'm here every other couple Wednesdays a month and I do tarot readings here. I also do online tarot readings where we can do something face to face like this. If um, you know, you're somewhere out of my location. So, um, so yeah, so you can find me on my Instagram pages uh, and also you can shop my CBD products on jadecollaborative.com. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I will go ahead and link those all below to make it easier for our audience to find you. And I just want to thank you for coming on and sharing your wisdom. I know that we can probably talk forever (laughs) about all these things. And uh, what you've shared is, I think, will resonate so deeply because it's it really mirrors my own story. And Mm -hmm. I I think people need some guidance and ideas on different modalities to, to help them, you know, get through their spiritual awakening. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes, agreed. Well, thank you so much for having me, Jassy. And thank you for everyone who took the time to share their space with me today. Absolutely. Thank you. And for our listeners, if you enjoyed our conversation, please comment down below, like and subscribe, and I'll see you next week.